one of those mothers was faithful to my soul. I'll be forever grateful. Praise the Lord. We're turning to the book of First Thessalonians this morning. First Thessalonians chapter 5. Call your attention also to John 3, verse 7. St. John chapter 3, verse 7. And 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 23 and 24. There seems to be in this day a doctrinal illiteracy. A doctrinal illiteracy. It swept across our land and the holiness movement has not escaped it. The blessed beloved doctrine of holiness has become a target of the devil. A target of the devil. I was listening to back years ago Marvin Powers telling that Dr. Brzee, who I believe preached for the Methodist Church, pastored in Methodism, left that group and was one of the founding fathers of the old Nazarene Church. Marvin Powers said that Brzee did not leave Methodism over standards. He said, and I'm only quoting what he said, that really Brazil was not all that old-fashioned. But he left and became a part of the beginning of a new group called the Nazarenes for the sake of preserving the doctrine of second blessing holiness. It's not a new thing that holiness has become the target of the devil. And we may think that it's unimportant about our doctrine, but it isn't unimportant. We let it become tainted, and we soon will not have the doctrine of holiness. Just like Methodism, just like some of our old line mother churches, it really becomes unimportant to them. Pardon me, but I desire to be a holiness preacher. That's right. And I desire to keep the doctrine of holiness entire sanctification untainted. That's right. I love the standards. I try my best to preach them. Try my best to stand by them and with them. But I love this doctrine as well. And I make no apologies for that. There is a doctrinal illiteracy sweeping across the land. I don't want to be a part of it. I want a clear cut doctrine of salvation and second blessing holiness. I don't want any shadows in it. I want us to have something solid beneath our feet, scripturally. If Jesus tarries, there's a generation coming behind me. And I don't want that generation to be reaching out with eager hands for a doctrine that I can't give them. A shriveled up faith. A shrunken, shriveled faith. And a withered up doctrine. And a drifting, whirly 
backslidden church. I want to give them something live. And I want to give them something that's scripturally solid and scripturally sound. I have a responsibility if Jesus should tarry to the oncoming generation. Really doesn't matter, Sister Williams, what we believe relative to this. Yes, it does, my dear friend. It matters very, very much. And you who may think it doesn't matter, you kind of make me think of a couple of fellas, let's call them Jim and Joe. They were out in a wooded area, mountainous wooded area hunting, and lost their way. They got lost. I mean, lost. Became disoriented. Lost their way. Joe says to Jim, I think if we go this way, by and by, we will come to our destination. We'll come out of this lost condition. Let's go this way. And so Jim follows Joe through the underbrush, up mountain and down mountains and up hills and down hills and for some time blundering their way. Jim looked at Joe and said, Joe, do you know where you're going? Do you know where we are? Where are we? And Joe looked at Jim and said, I don't know, but we sure are making good time. Don't know where I am, don't know where I'm going, but I'm sure making good time. Let's know where we're going. Let's know where we are. It doesn't count just to make good time going someplace we don't know where we're going. Being located somewhere where we don't know where we are. You can know you're saved. You can know you're sanctified. You can know you're happy on your way to heaven. You can know why you believe what you believe. You can have some scripture to put your feet down on. Jesus said in John's gospel, chapter 3, verse 7, Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 23 and 24, And the very God of peace sanctify you. W-H-O-L-L-Y, which means completely or entirely. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he who hath called us, or called you, who also will do it. Will you help us for a little while this morning, our Father? We're not adequate for the job. We confess to thee our inability, and our inadequacy. But we ask for your help today. Anoint our hearts, illumine our minds, touch our tongue, help us to speak as the pen of a ready writer, accomplish thy purpose in this service this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. I believe that in these two statements of Scripture, we have brought to our attention two distinct and two definite works of grace. Ye must be born again, and the very God of peace sanctify you completely or wholly. The first work of grace is in actuality the beginning of the second. And the second is the sealing of the first. 
There is absolutely no way for you to continue to maintain a justified experience without obtaining a sanctified experience. The only way the justified may come to light on holiness, the only way you can keep from being sanctified is to backslide. But I've sought and sought and sought and I can't get sanctified. Sister Ada Hobbs said, if you seek and seek and can't get saved or can't get sanctified, get saved then. Get saved. I'm not talking about folk who are seeking <clears throat> diligently, making progress in their seeking holiness. But if you're seeking and seeking and seeking and always thrashing over the same issues and running around always the same territory and never making any progress in your seeking holiness, it's an indication your justified experience somewhere isn't clear. Or you're not living victoriously in your justified experience. One of the problems, one of the serious problems with some of our seekers seeking holiness is that they wait until they got, they waited until they got into spiritual trouble before they began to seek holiness. And when you do that, friend, you're not yet a candidate for holiness. If you wait until carnality has its demonstration and manifestation, you're not a candidate for holiness until that demonstration and manifestation of carnality is cleared up and put under the blood. For instance, you have heard me, some of you, tell about the lady in the state of New York that came. She unfortunately had earned herself the reputation of being a troublemaker. Some folks have earned that reputation. Folk are not picking at you when they recognize that you're a troublemaker. You've earned that reputation. She had been the heartache of the pastor's wife. She had been the trouble stirrer. But she got saved. I mean, she really did get saved. Genuinely converted. So gloriously saved that even the pastor's wife said, something has happened to Pat. She was saved. She was doing so well. Somewhere along the line in the midst of revival meeting, the Lord began to impress on our heart messages of holiness. We tried to preach holiness. One day after that, in the midst of that, Pat was at the door. She came in and talked a bit, and she was telling me that though she believed that the Bible taught holiness, and she believed that we, we must have it, and we, we need it, and so on, but she said, I don't feel my need of holiness. Someone had unfortunately misinformed Pat and told her that when she got sanctified, you know, and she wouldn't be hating anybody. And Well, that isn't the measure of holiness. If you're justified, you're not hating anybody. If you're justified, you have a forgiving spirit. You have forgiven. If you haven't forgiven, you aren't forgiven. Jesus taught that, and you wouldn't have to read past the first seven chapters of Matthew's gospel to find that. 
Why, she said, I ain't nobody. I'm not riled up at anybody. She gave a good, justified testimony. But she said, I don't feel the need of holiness. I tried to be charitable with Pat, for I'm convinced, people, that not simply because an individual hears a message on holiness or a couple or so messages on holiness, do they necessarily have light. It is not necessarily hearing, it's apprehending truth that gives us light. And some folks hear with their ears and never apprehend that, at least for a while, with their hearts. But while they're sitting in the congregation and hearing with their ears, it isn't sinking in. Their minds are somewhere else and their thoughts are somewhere else. I tried to be charitable with Pat. Maybe she's been in the hole in this church and hasn't really apprehended hole in this truth. While I'm a very poor conversationalist, it's difficult for me, it isn't easy for me, let me say it that way, sometimes at least, to be a conversationalist. But I think I've made a pretty good listener while others talk. And so I listened while Pat talked, and I've discovered in being a listener, I've discovered that if you give an individual enough rope, you know what they do with it. So when I listened, I just let her have the rope. And the more she talked, the more she persuaded me, she does have light. She has light. We prayed together and I said to her, Now, Pat, don't wait for something to happen and you have some kind of a big flare-up to make you feel your need of holiness. We ought not wait for that to begin to seek holiness. Don't wait, I said, Pat, don't wait for that. Before she left, I said, now, Pat, somewhere, someone is going to touch your kids. I should have said children, but I said kids. And you're not going to take it. Haven't you discovered, especially if you've had any dealings with a Christian day school, you've discovered that you can touch some folks mighty hard and they'll take it quite well. But if you touch junior or iodine, you're in trouble. I mean, you're ready for a school split. There's an explosion. It might even split your church. You touched somebody's child. It was the month of October we were there in that meeting. Halloween season. Trick or treat night fell during the meeting. Pat came to church that night, but you know where her children went. Yes, they did. They went trick-or-treating. And if I know some of her children well, her boy at least, probably, maybe, more treating than tricking rather than treating, maybe. I don't know. Pat walked normally back and forth to church. She lived not too far away from the church, and she normally walked to church. I didn't get this second hand. She told me herself. She made it a, a real honest, open admission on her way to, from church that night. On her way home, she came on the scene just in time to see a, an older boy or to see a boy out of the community let her daughter Patricia have it with a raw egg. I mean, she was a dripping with raw egg. He might have smeared her with more than one of them, I don't know. But Pat came on the scene just in time to see that boy smash Patricia with a raw egg. 
Oh, my brother. By her own admission, she said, I grabbed him. She said it. And she said, if I hadn't grabbed him with this hand, I'd have hit him. Honey, sanctified. Well, basically, yes. But not yet. Pat was now in no position to be sanctified. I'm convinced that Pat needed to ask God to forgive her. I don't mean Pat had to go back over all of her old past that was already under the blood. But Pat had to ask God to forgive her for that demonstration of carnality. I believe she needed to find that boy personally. I believe she needed to find that boy and ask him to forgive her. I think it would have been well if she would have apologized to her children and anybody else that might have been around beholding that situation that night. The holiness woman, not the holy woman, but the holiness woman coming from holiness revival and, and creating such a scene as she created. Now that maybe is why some of you have sought and sought and sought and sought holiness and made no progress in your seeking holiness and have never arrived at an experience quoting you that works. Jesus said, ye must be born again. There's more to this new birth experience than just profession to be born again. We're living in a day when just about anything or anybody can say it's born again. And our people swoon, oh, isn't this wonderful born again movie star, born again wrestler, born again boxer, born again football player, born again TV star, born again country western singer, and going on performing their same old deeds. Well, pardon me, you can think I'm critical if you want to. My heart has no critical feeling about the matter, but I'm just telling you, I don't believe that stuff. Amen. I believe if an individual is born again, he's a new creature in Christ Jesus. All things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. I don't believe he continues to curse and revile and smoke and drink and carouse and be immoral and play the world. I don't believe that. All things are passed away. The Greek tense of that verb is, it literally means they passed away back there when God saved me, but they're still gone today. And they were made new back there when He saved me, but it's still new today. Profess to be born again and drink wine at the inaugural balls and involve themselves in all kind of worldly sinful activities and yet our people think it's the greatest thing going. So and so's born again. He wrote this story up in the guidepost. But if we're born again people, we'll be a changed individual. It's a supernatural work of the Spirit of God wrought in the heart of mankind that makes them absolutely new. Praise the Lord. You don't think ball players could be born again? Oh, I think they could be born again. You don't think movie stars could get saved? Oh, yes, I think they could get saved. You don't think those kind of folks out there in the entertainment world could get saved? I'm convinced they could get saved. But if they get saved just like anybody else, they'll have to change. There will be a change if they genuinely are converted. Walking through a Bible bookstore browsing a bit while the girls were probably looking for children's material. And I came across one of those racks that have the cards in it, you know, personal testimonies of different individuals, pictures on the front, little testimonies on the back. Dale and Roy have them sometimes, you know, and those kind of folks. 
Now, I don't know if I had thumbed through some of those or looked through some of them or if it was the very first one in the rack. And here he was, burly old-looking fella, testimony on the back of being a born-again Christian wrestler, I believe he was. And his picture on the front most certainly didn't bear witness to the fact that he was a born-again believer. He didn't have one stitch of clothes on but his wrestling trunks. If you're born again, you'll be a new creature. You'll be a new creature. You'll be like the transformed something that comes out of the chrysalis or the old cocoon. An old worm, when he spun himself inside a cocoon, conformed to the world, crawled in the dirt, and crawled through the grime and the scruff, but he didn't mind crawling through the dirt. Worms have an affinity to dirt, like sinners have an affinity to sin. But something took place on the inside of that chrysalis or inside of that cocoon. They call it metamorphosis. The word that you and I would understand a little better is transformation. A transformation took place on the inside of that cocoon. And when that metamorphosis period or transformation period was finished, that cocoon burst open and something came out of there. It was a fuzzy worm when it went in there, but it was a beautiful butterfly when it came out of there. It didn't go back down and start crawling in the dirt, conformed to the world. It had a desire for higher altitudes. It was flying higher. It was a beautiful butterfly. Now, not a worm, but a butterfly. Butterfly. didn't look like a worm, wasn't dressed like a worm, and didn't act like a worm. And when you come from beneath the speaking blood that we heard preached about yesterday morning, a transformed individual, you will no longer look, talk, act the same. Praise the Lord. You must be born again. You must be born again. That's the beginning of this work of holiness. Nobody can get sanctified without that beginning work. That's the beginning. It'll have to be 100% justified victory to get the experience of second blessing holiness. It's the beginning of the second. God wants to finish his work. You kind of make me think, you know, a little, little fella, the folk that won't get sanctified, kind of makes me think of a little boy, you heard about him, I guess, that asked his mother one day in her busy schedule, he said, Mama, where did man come from? She was busy, you know, like mothers can be. Really, mothers ought not be too busy to answer that kind of a question. But she was busy, and her curt answer to her inquisitive boy was, Mud! We just came from mud! Well, that started the wheels turning in that little fellow's mind. Mud, we came from mud, man was made from mud. And so he made his way down to the old creek bank. And he began to scoop some mud upon the bank. And he started making himself a man. Man made from mud. Man came from mud. And he took the mud and formed a head and a neck and shaped him out shoulders and the torso of a body and arms and one leg. And about that time, his mama called him to supper. And he left his partially created man lying on the creek bank. He's all made but one leg. And he made up his mind that as soon as supper was finished and evening chores were done, he would be back to finish his man. But while he was gone, the mischievous youngin out of the neighborhood came along and found his man and pushed it in the creek. And the water washed his man away. Well, needless to say, the little fellow was disappointed when he returned to the creek bank and found his man was gone. I don't know how much time passed by, some days, I guess, maybe weeks, I'm not sure, but... 
One day after this had taken place, he was with his mother uptown. Walking down the street, he, he saw an unfortunate amputee coming along on his crutches, one leg. him and looked at him and looked at his missing leg and finally walked up to him and he, and he said, why didn't you wait till I was finished with you? And I wonder that about some other folks. Why didn't they wait until God had finished the work? He began a good work in you when he saved you. He wants to finish it. He wants to sanctify you. But some of you have run off before you let him finish the work that he started. You've not tarried. You've not sought. You've not surrendered. You've not yielded. Somewhere along the line, there's something that's kept you from getting the victory. Maybe an evil heart of unbelief. I have no idea. But God began a good work in you when He saved you. But it's not good enough, friend, to keep you all the way from here to the city. When you've come to the light on holiness, and you have to pursue holiness on that experience. And don't misunderstand that. I can almost feel the enemy take advantage of that. Said, no, you've said justification isn't good enough. It isn't enough to get you on to heaven when you come to the light of holiness and reject it or willfully neglect it. Your justified experience is forfeited. Amen. The experience of second blessing holiness, this is a second call. It's a sacred call. It's not the call of the church. It isn't the call of a little singled out group. And it isn't the call of a peculiar little crowd of people. And it isn't the call of John Wesley and John Fletcher. And it isn't the call of some little group known as the Holiness Church. It's the call of God. According as He has chosen us uh, to, to be holy. And God did not call us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness and faithful is He who hath called us who also will do it. This is the call of God. That makes it a sacred call. And because it's a second sacred call, it's a serious call. Because it's not the call of the church. And because it's not the call of the evangelist. And because it's not the call of some denomination. And because it's not the call of some church leader or some particular little group of people. But because it's the call of God, it's a Serious call. Thank God for this holiness. That rids us of that old anti goodness, that that carnal nature, that anti godness in the heart. That's something that if you allow it to stay there, will somewhere down the road raise a fist in the face of God and say, No, there's something about it that's anti God. That's what the Bible teaches. It is not subject to the law of God, it is the enemy of God. It's enmity against God, this carnal nature. And when you think you have it in subjection and subdued, well, Sister Williams, it's, it is, it is, it's subdued. It's, it's, uh, what is the word they use? Suppressed. The blood suppresses carnality. Nowhere in the Bible does the Word of God ever ascribe suppressive power to the blood of Christ. Nowhere. If carnality is suppressed, and it can be for a time, but it is not suppressed by the blood, it is suppressed by you. The blood does not have suppressive power ascribed to it. Nowhere does the Bible teach that. Forgiving, pardoning, atoning, cleansing, but never suppress, suppressing power. And you can't suppress it forever. You hold its head down, its feet will fly up. Hold his feet down, his ugly head will fly up somewhere. You can't suppress it. You're not big enough. You're not big enough. Oh, I know 
Oh, you're more spiritual than some of the rest of us. But you can't keep it down. He'll poke his head up in the form of pride. Or dissension. Or anger. Or a multitude of other forms. Where you see carnality is like a hydra-headed monster. Not subject to the law of God. It's not subject to your law forever. It'll defeat you. That's the thing that gets the wrangles of going in the church. Yeah, we can get along. The way we just get. Yeah, there are a couple of groups that were worshiping in the same church building. Two different times. They set up their schedule. They didn't have their own churches. And they were worshiping in the same church building. One group apparently owned the church and they arranged the schedule where the other group could come in and, and have use of their church and that worked well until winter. And the one church group said to the other, don't use our coal out of the coal bin, that's our coal. You can't use that coal to heat this building for your services. That's our coal. So, the other crowd just built them a coal shed. Got them a load of coal. Rather than fuss with the crowd that wanted to fuss about it, they just built them a coal shed. Got them a load of coal. One Sunday morning when they went to church, Someone had written on the side of the church building, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, two coal shed. Funny and humorous, but so true to life where carnality reigns. It means that the ones that are sanctified that we're all going to agree and see everything just exactly the same. I really don't think so. I really don't think so. But I believe we get along. Brother Noel Scott tells of the little couple and some of you have heard about that little couple in the church. Church saw it necessary. Some felt it necessary to build on a new part to their church. They were having some growth, and they felt like they needed a new addition to the church, and and so they they brought it to a vote whether we should now put on the new addition or not. And the little couple, sanctified couple, recognized that there was a need, but for some reason, I don't know if they felt about the finances. I don't really know why, but they just felt like this wasn't the time to build. And when it came to a vote, it was their prerogative, it was their privilege to vote however they felt was proper and right to vote, and they voted no. There's nothing wrong with voting no, if you keep a right attitude about it. But the rest of the crowd voted yes. And of course, the majority vote carried and they were going to put on the addition. Now, I know just as well as I know my name what some of our people would have done, Brother Smart. They just said, well, if that's the way it's going to be, they're not getting any of my tithe. And let me ask you something. Who, who told you it was your tithe in the first place? It isn't your tithe. The tithe is holy the Lord's. It's God's tithe. That's why it's robbery if you keep it. That's right. I won't put my tithe. It's not your tithe. I'll just go somewhere else. Well, dear friend, there's another church somewhere on some corner that'll have you and pity him. But they'll take you in. 
or they don't have any respect for my opinion and they just, you, you don't know how I have it over there. And I voted and they didn't appreciate my vote and they voted it, my vote down and on and on. You know the mess. But this little sanctified couple, brother, when it came time to start the building of the new addition on the church, the church folk were going to do a lot of their own labor to save finances, to save money. And they set a work day to begin building on that church. And individuals were coming with hammers and, and what have you, and I'm going to help. You want to know the first little couple that was there? That little couple that voted no. They didn't hop and pop and pout and storm and steam. They had a holy heart. They didn't feel like it was the time. They didn't feel like this was the right time. I don't know why. I have no idea why they felt like voting no. But when the rest of the crowd voted yes, they said we're going to help build it. We're going to help get it together. We're going to help labor. Brother, what's the matter with us? That we have to fuss and snort and steam and storm. There's a carnal nature on the inside. That's what's the matter with us. We're not sanctified and fuss and snort and wrangle and steam and fume. holiness that works when opinions are rejected. And someone puts our vote down. Glory to God. I'm not talking about issues of right and wrong and sin. And, 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 and I'm not talking about that. You know, Lord, stand and take your stand and do it sweetly even if you're accused of being otherwise. I understand that. But issues that really aren't all that important as to whether we put down green or blue carpet or whether we get a Wurlitzer or a Story and Clark or whether we get a Hammond or a Goldbrands and things that really aren't all of that much importance. Carnality could be humorous if it wasn't so sad and so pitiful. One gal was making confession to the church in one of our meetings and oh, through her tears she said, I want you to forgive me. said to the church, I want you to forgive me. I, I just had this bad feeling and attitude or whatever her words were about the kind of piano you got. I didn't like the kind of piano you got. And she had this bad feeling about it, you know. Oh, carnal feeling. And really, I couldn't figure out why it made one nickel's worth of difference to her what kind of piano the church bought. But she didn't even play the piano. We can fuss and wrangle over the silliest things. It doesn't make us all have the same kind of appetites and likes and dislikes. I just, I just don't understand how anybody can enjoy chocolate ice cream. Not for the life of me, I can't understand it. Penny loves it. I just don't like it. And I really can't understand anybody that could like the bitter stuff. But it doesn't mean that Penny's sanctified and I'm not, or I'm sanctified and she's not. We're all three different living in that motor home, all three of us. Looks like a sizable place to live, but really it isn't too big for three women to live in. Not three who are all different. You probably just fuss and wrangle and fight over things. You're welcome to come drop in. Stand outside and listen. Walls are real thin. Well, while you're out there, be careful because we can hear you too. We have. <laughs> you probably fuss and wrangle over the whole affair. No, we don't. One little careless about this or careless about that. One of us had the habit of leaving a cupboard door open and you get something out of the cupboard. Another one leaves the closet door hang open or I guess maybe the same one does that. 
and reaches into the drawer, you know, pull the drawer open and get something out of the drawer. And if you push it, you don't push it completely shut. You leave it partly open and maybe something hanging out of it. One a little more particular about bed making, the other a little less particular about it, you know, if you get the wrinkles out, so what? You know, so what? Let me get in it in a few more hours again anyway. What matters? But we don't go around, you know, saying, Shut the door! I'm sick and tired of this. I shut this door up to you over and over and over and over. Sick of it. I'm so sick of this. Look, it looks like, look like a bunch of hogs live here. In a, in this laid around here and this laid around there and something hanging out of a cupboard door or out of the, out of the chest of drawer and, and, and a cupboard door hanging open and, and look at the mess up there and they'll think we're a bunch of hogs or, or whatever. Shut the door! Shut the door! Put it in! Only take a few more seconds. We don't talk to one another like that. And we don't need to go to Mr. Gothers to find out how to treat one another. That's why some of our holiness people have run after that outfit because they haven't treated one another like God's Word tells them to treat one another. And consequently, they've had to go to find out how to operate their home and run their family and treat one another. You get old-time religion in your heart. I wasn't of the disposition that was by nature kind. I wasn't the disposition that was by nature take things. I didn't take things. I was hair-triggered in my temper. I was just like my father. He was quick tempered and quick natured and a hair triggered in his nature and the least little thing could be a provocation that could just light the fuse of the powder keg and it generally exploded. And that was not my nature to say it would have been my nature to say shut up! That's a stupidity. Shut it. It only take you two more seconds to stop that article of clothing in the drawer and shut it clear up. That would have been my nature. And it would have been my nature to say, now look, leave that open one more time. Just leave it open one more time. You can't be anything different than the way you were born. Yes, you can. By the grace of God. <laughs> Hallelujah! That's enough to bless a Presbyterian on a Thursday morning. At least it's enough to bless this Methodist girl, a girl that had grown up in a Methodist church, to think I could be delivered from the thing that not only injured others, but made me feel mighty bad often after it was over. I'd feel badly after the old carnal blow up was over. I want you to know it's enough to make me feel like having a will be this morning to know that there's victory over that mess and there's deliverance from that mess that ugly mess of rottenness on the inside that ugly carnal thing that wouldn't behave I wanted it to and I tried to make it behave brother smart but I couldn't I couldn't forever I'd be successful for a little while and I'd be successful under certain pressures but there were some things I couldn't handle it I remember the day I had to ask permission to leave the study hall, I believe it was, in school. Some young girl in another class had said something, and I get, apparently didn't like it. I can't even remember the details anymore. That's been a lot of years ago. And I asked permission, may I, may I be excused from the study hall a few moments or whatever. And I was given permission, brother. I trudged my way down that old school hall. I knew where Cynthia was in class, and I knocked on the door. And someone came to the door of that classroom and I said, could I speak to Cynthia? Could I speak to Cynthia? 
Oh, I had behaved properly to Cynthia. I had spoken like I shouldn't have spoken to Cynthia. Oh, Cynthia, I want you to forgive me. I want you to forgive me. Brother, that thing wouldn't always behave itself. That thing wouldn't always behave itself. And you may think you're pious and sanctimonious, but it won't behave itself for you either. It just won't forever behave itself for you either. Why don't you just throw down your arms and surrender to Him? Surrender to Jesus. Yielding not your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourself unto God without one reservation, a total abandonment of yourself to Him. Praise God. Sweet Mary, Sister William, I, I, I think that this abiding comforter, this cleansing, this, this surely must be the promise to the sinner. No. No. It's to the church, to the believers. Consider, I, I appreciate it, Brother Burt's scripture that he quoted this morning. You consider from the scriptures that the abiding comforter is not promised by Jesus in John's Gospel, chapters 14 through 16 to the penitent sinner. Read it. The abiding comforter is not promised by Jesus to the penitent sinner. but to the believer. They were believers on the day of Pentecost, prior to Pentecost. And the abiding comforter came, like Jesus promised, to the believers. The believers who were already in Christ. Read it yourself who already loved Christ. He opened his address. Remember in John 14, ye believe in God. They were a bunch of unbelievers. Ye believe in God. And he assured them that they were the heirs of mansions being prepared that would be prepared in the Father's house. I go to prepare a place for you. They were believers. I, go, they weren't impenitent sinners. I go to prepare a place for you. You know, don't you, that a place is already prepared for impenitent sinners. It wasn't prepared for them. It was prepared for the devil and his angels. But it has become the habitation of men who will not repent. Let's be Bible Christian. He promised, I will receive you unto myself. He never made that to unregenerated men. He never made that promise to unregenerated men. These men were regenerated, believing heirs of God. The distinct condition for receiving the abiding comforter is love toward Christ evidenced by obedience. We heard it this morning. Brother Burke gave us the scripture. If ye love me, keep my commands. And if you love him, you will keep his commands. And Jesus said, I will pray the Father and he will give you another comforter 
that he may abide with you forever. That's the condition for the reception of the abiding comforter. Love him. Evidenced by obeying him. And that obedience becomes total obedience in our total surrender. Well, that's where it changed. Just give up everything to him. That's right. We used to hear it preached, Brother Smart, that it's like we have a blank sheet of paper and we sign the bottom of that blank sheet of paper and give it to God. And that says to God, ask anything of me. Ask anything of me and I will do it. Anything. Send me anywhere. Require anything of me. Ask anything of me. And here's my signature on the dotted line. As soon as I know that it's your will, I will do it. That's a total abandonment of yourself to Him. Yield yourself unto God with your hands off. With your hands off. What if? Yield that to God too. What if? You heard about the man, I've got to close. You're going to ring the bell on me. The fellow that worked in the glass factory, blowing little delicate objects with glass from glass. And he had fashioned a beautiful, delicate object for a friend of his. And, and, and he was holding that beautiful little delicate object out and was giving the little speech of presenting this. I've, I've made this just for you. It's, it's yours. I want you to have it. It's, I, I made it for you and it's yours. And here it is. It's, and all the while he was holding on to it. And his friend was standing there with, with a hand outstretched, reaching for his gift. And the fellow just continued to go through his little speech of he had made it just for you and it's yours and I want you to have it. It's, it's yours. I'm giving it to you. But he never did release it. And finally his friend looked at him and said, is it mine? Well, he said, yes, it's yours. I'm giving it to you. He said, then if it's mine, let go of it. Well, but the fellow that made it said, but, but I'm afraid that you'll take a hold of it so roughly that you'll break it. He said, is it mine? If it's mine and I break it, it's my loss, not yours. Is it his? If he breaks it, it's his business. If he crushes it, it's his business. Sanctify. Totally his. Completely abandoned to him. Thoroughly abandoned to his will. Yielded without a reservation. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Fellow that went off to camp meeting. And a old farmer, he wanted to get sanctified. He prayed and prayed and sought and sought in the camp meeting. He prayed clear through and God sanctified him wholly. He was enjoying the camp meeting, brother. Sanctified. He was enjoying it. And, and he got a message from home. It's, and the message said, hurry home. You better leave that camp meeting and get home. It said the grasshoppers have invaded your wheat fields and they're eating up your your wheat crop. He sent a message back and said, God sanctified me. And that's God's wheat field. And if he wants to pasture his grasshoppers on his wheat field, that's his business. I'm standing for camp meeting. Hallelujah. Can we yield ourselves utterly to him and abandon everything we have to his will and leave reputation and leave everything else in his hands. We're his. If he breaks it, it's his business. If he crushes it, it's his business. If he squeezes the juice out of it, it's his business. Hallelujah. Blessed holiness experience is not just the absence of carnality. It is the absence of carnality.
thing. And the deliverance, the eradication of carnality. But it's not just that. It's the presence of the Holy Ghost in His fullness. It's like a clear day, Brother Marshall Smart. A clear day doesn't just mean the absence of a cloud. It means the presence of the sunshine. And holiness is not just the absence of carnality. It means the presence of the Almighty Comforter. Hallelujah. Thank God for holiness. Hallelujah for holiness. You can fuss over it, argue over it, wrangle over it, and discuss it and, and fuss over it. But I dare to stand by what this blessed book teaches. It will yield and surrender and lay down our soul.